section forty nine of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the history of the theatre during its suppression a period in our dramatic annals has been passed over during the progress of the civil wars which indeed was one of silence but not of repose in the theatre it lasted beyond the death of charles i when the fine arts seemed also to have suffered with the monarch the theatre for the first time in any nation was abolished by a public ordinance and the actors and consequently all that family of genius who by their labours or their tastes are connected with the drama were reduced to silence the actors were forcibly dispersed and became even some of the most persecuted objects of the new government it may excite our curiosity to trace the hidden footsteps of this numerous fraternity of genius hypocrisy and fanaticism had at length triumphed over wit and satire a single blow could not however annihilate those never-dying powers nor is suppression always extinction reduced to a state which did not allow of uniting in a body still their habits and their affections could not desert them actors would attempt to resume their functions and the genius of the authors and the tastes of the people would occasionally break out though scattered and concealed mr gifford has noticed in his introduction to massinger the noble contrast between our actors at that time with those of revolutionary france when to use his own emphatic expression one wretched actor only deserted his sovereign while of the vast multitude fostered by the nobility and the royal family of france not one individual adhered to their cause all rushed madly forward to plunder and assassinate their benefactors the contrast is striking but the result must be traced to a different principle for the cases are not parallel as they appear the french actors did not occupy the same ground as ours here the fanatics shut up the theatre and extirpated the art and the artists there the fanatics enthusiastically converted the theatre into an instrument of their own revolution and the french actors therefore found an increased national patronage it was natural enough that actors would not desert a flourishing profession the plunder and assassinations indeed were quite peculiar to themselves as frenchmen not as actors the destruction of the theatre here was the result of an ancient quarrel between the puritanic party and the whole corps dramatique in this little history of plays and players like more important history we perceive how all human events form but a series of consequences linked together and we must go back to the reign of elizabeth to comprehend an event which occurred in that of charles i it has been perhaps peculiar to this land of contending opinions and of happy and unhappy liberty that a gloomy sect was early formed who drawing as they fancied the principles of their conduct from the literal precepts of the gospel formed those views of human nature which were more practicable in a desert than a city and which were rather suited to a monastic order than to a polished people these were our puritans who at first perhaps from utter simplicity among other extravagant reforms imagined that of the extinction of the theatre numerous works from that time fatigued their own pens and their readers heads founded on literal interpretations of the scriptures which were applied to our drama though written ere our drama existed voluminous quotations from the fathers who had only witnessed farcical interludes and licentious pantomimes they even quoted classical authority to prove that a stage player was considered infamous by the romans among whom however rassius the admiration of rome received the princely remuneration of a thousand denarii per diem 
tragedian aesopus bequeathed about one hundred and fifty thousand pounds to his son remunerations which showed the high regard in which the great actors were held among the roman people a series of writers might be collected of these anti-dramatists footnote several of them have been reprinted by the shakespeare society since the above was written particularly the work of gasson here alluded to End of footnote the licentiousness of our comedies had too often indeed presented a fair occasion for their attacks and they at length succeeded in purifying the stage we owe them this good but we owe little gratitude to that blind zeal which was desirous of extinguishing the theatre which wanted the taste also to feel that the theatre was a popular school of morality that the stage is a supplement to the pulpit where virtue according to plato's sublime idea moves our love and affections when made visible to the eye of this class among the earliest writers was stephen gasson who in fifteen seventy nine published the school of abuse or a pleasant invective against poets players jesters and such like caterpillars yet this gosson dedicated his work to sir philip sidney a great lover of plays and one who has vindicated their morality in his defence of poesy the same puritanic spirit soon reached our universities for when a dr gager had a play performed at christ church dr reynolds of queen's college terrified at the satanic novelty published the overthrow of stage plays fifteen ninety three a tedious invective foaming at the mouth of its text with quotations and authorities for that was the age when authority was stronger than opinion and the slightest could awe the readers reynolds takes great pains to prove that a stage play is infamous by the opinions of antiquity that a theatre corrupts morals by those of the fathers but the most reasonable point of attack is the sin of boys wearing the dress and affecting the airs of women footnote the historica histrionica note stephen hammerton as a most noted and beautiful woman actor in the early part of the seventeenth century alexander goff the woman actor at blackfriars is also mentioned as acting privately in oliver's time End of footnote this was too long a flagrant evil in the theatrical economy to us there appears something so repulsive in the exhibition of boys or men personating female characters that one cannot conceive how they could ever have been tolerated as a substitute for the spontaneous grace the melting voice and the soothing looks of a female it was quite impossible to give the tenderness of a woman to any perfection of feeling in a personating male and to this cause may we not attribute that the female characters have never been made chief personages among our elder poets as they would assuredly have been had they not been conscious that the male actor could not have sufficiently affected the audience a poet who lived in charles the second's day and who has written a prologue to othello to introduce the first actress on our stage has humorously touched on this gross absurdity our women are defective and so sized you'd think they were some of the guard disguised for to speak truth men act that are between forty and fifty wenches of fifteen with brows so large and nerves so uncompliant when you called as the enter giant yet at the time the absurd custom prevailed tom nash in his pierce penalessa commends our stage for not having as they had abroad women actors or courtesans as he calls them and even so late as in sixteen fifty when women were first introduced on our stage endless are the apologies for the indecorum of this novel usage such are the difficulties which occur even in forcing bad customs to return to nature and so long does it take to infuse into the multitude a little common sense 
it is even probable that this happy revolution originated from mere necessity rather than from choice for the boys who had been trained to act female characters before the rebellion during the present suspension of the theatre had grown too masculine to resume their tender office at the restoration and as the same poet observes doubting we should never play again we have played all our women into men so that the introduction of women was the mere result of necessity hence all these apologies for the most natural ornament of the stage footnote one actor william keniston continued to perform female characters in the reign of charles the second and his performances were praised by dryden and preferred by many to that of the ladies themselves he was so great a favourite with the fair sex that the court ladies used to take him in their coaches for an airing in hyde park End of footnote this volume of reynolds seems to have been the shadow and precursor of one of the most substantial of literary monsters in the tremendous historiomastics or player's scourge of prynne in sixteen thirty three in that volume of more than a thousand closely printed quarto pages all that was ever written against plays and players perhaps may be found what followed could only have been transcripts from a genius who could raise at once the mountain and the mouse yet collier so late as in sixteen ninety eight renewed the attack still more vigorously and with final success although he left room for arthur bedford a few years afterwards in his evil and danger of stage plays in which extraordinary work he produced seven thousand instances taken out of plays of the present century and a catalogue of fourteen hundred texts of scripture ridiculed by the stage this religious anti-dramatist must have been more deeply read in the drama than even its most fervent lovers his piety pursued too deeply the study of such impious productions and such labours were probably not without more amusement than he ought to have found in them this stage persecution which began in the reign of elizabeth had been necessarily resented by the theatrical people and the fanatics were really objects too tempting for the traitors in wit and satire to pass by they had made themselves very marketable and the puritans changing their character with the times from elizabeth to charles i were often the tartuffes of the stage Footnote ben jonson was one of their hardest enemies and his zeal of the land busy justice overdue and dame purecraft have never been surpassed in masterly delineation of puritanic cant the dramatists of that era certainly did their best to curb puritanism by exposure End of footnote but when they became the government itself in sixteen forty two all the theatres were suppressed because stage plays do not suit with seasons of humiliation but fasting and praying have been found very effectual this was but a mild cant and the suppression at first was only to be temporary but as they gained strength the hypocrite who had at first only struck a gentle blow at the theatre with redoubled vengeance buried it in its own ruins alexander brome in his verses on richard brome's comedies discloses the secret motive tis worth our note bishops and players both suffered in one vote and reason good for they had cause to fear them one did suppress their schisms and t'other jeer them bishops were guiltiest for they swelled with riches t'other had naught but verses songs and speeches and by their ruin the state did no more but rob the spittle and unrag the poor they poured forth the long suppressed bitterness of their souls six years afterwards in their ordinance of sixteen forty eight for the suppression of all stage plays and for the taking down all their boxes stages and seats whatsoever that so there might be no more plays acted those proud parroting players are described as a sort of superbious ruffians and because sometimes the asses are clothed in lion skins the dolts imagine themselves somebody and walk in as great state as caesar this ordinance against boxes stages and seats was without a metaphor a war of extermination 
they passed their ploughshare over the land of the drama and sowed it with their salt and the spirit which raged in the governing powers appeared in the deed of one of their followers when an actor had honourably surrendered himself in battle to this spurious saint he exclaimed cursed be he who doth the work of the lord negligently and shot his prisoner because he was an actor we find some account of the dispersed actors in that curious morsel of historica histrionica preserved in the twelfth volume of dodsley's old plays full of the traditional history of the theatre which the writer appears to have gleaned from the reminiscences of the old cavalier his father the actors were malignants to a man if we accept that wretched actor as mr gifford distinguishes him who was however only such for his politics and he pleaded hard for his treason that he really was a presbyterian although an actor of these men who had lived in the sunshine of a court and amidst taste and criticism many perished in the field from their affection for their royal master some sought humble occupations and not a few who by habits long indulged and their own turn of mind had hands too delicate to put to work attempted often to entertain secret audiences and were often dragged to prison these disturbed audiences were too unpleasant to afford much employment to the actors francis kirkman the author and bookseller tells us they were often seized on by the soldiers and stripped and fined at their pleasure a curious circumstance occurred in the economy of these strolling theatricals these seizures often deprived them of their wardrobe and among the stage directions of the time may be found among the exits and the entrances these enter the red coat exit hat and cloak which were no doubt considered not as the least precious parts of the whole living company they were at length obliged to substitute painted cloth for the splendid habits of the drama at this epoch a great comic genius robert cox invented a peculiar sort of dramatic exhibition suited to the necessities of the time short pieces which he mixed with other amusements that these might disguise the acting it was under the pretence of rope dancing that he filled the red bull playhouse which was a large one with such a confluence that as many went back for want of room as entered the dramatic contrivance consisted of a combination of the richest comic scenes into one piece from shakespeare marston shirley etc concealed under some taking title and these pieces of plays were called humours or drolleries these had been collected by marsh and reprinted by kirkman as put together by cox for the use of theatrical booths at fairs Footnote the title of this collection is the wits or sport upon sport in select pieces of drollery digested into scenes by way of dialogue together with variety of humours of several nations fitted for the pleasure and content of all persons either in court city country or camp the like never before published printed for h marsh sixteen sixty two again printed for f kirkman sixteen seventy two to kirkman's edition is prefixed a curious print representing the inside of a bartholomew fair theatre by some supposed to be the red bull theatre in clerkenwell several characters are introduced in the middle of the stage a figure peeps out of the curtain on a label from his mouth is written to quoque it represents bubble a silly person in a comedy played so excellently by an actor named green that it was called green's to quoque then a changeling and a simpleton from plays by cox a french dancing master from the duke of newcastle's variety claus from beaumont and fletcher's beggar's bush and sir john falstaff and hostess our notion of falstaff by this print seems very different from that of our ancestors their falstaff is in extravaganza of obesity not requiring so much stuffing as ours does End of footnote. the argument prefixed to each piece serves as its plot and drawn as most are from some of our dramas these drolleries may still be read with great amusement and offer seen altogether an extraordinary specimen of our national humour 
the price this collection obtains among book collectors is excessive in the bouncing knight or the robbers robbed we recognize our old friend falstaff and his celebrated adventure the equal match is made out of rule a wife and have a wife and thus most there are however some original pieces by cox himself which were the most popular favourites being characters created by himself for himself from ancient farces such were the humours of john swabber simpleton the smith etc these remind us of the extemporal comedy and the pantomimical characters of italy invented by actors of genius this cox was the delight of the city the country and the universities assisted by the greatest actors of the time expelled from the theatre it was he who still preserved alive as it were by stealth the suppressed spirit of the drama that he merited the distinctive epithet of the incomparable robert cox as kirkman calls him we can only judge by the memorial of our mimetic genius which will be best given in kirkman's words as meanly as you may now think of these drolls they were then acted by the best comedians and i may say by some that then exceeded all now living the incomparable robert cox who was not only the principal actor but also the contriver and author of most of these farces how have i heard him cried up for his john swabber and simpleton the smith in which he being to appear with a large piece of bread and butter i have frequently known several of the female spectators and auditors to long for it and once that well-known natural jack adams of clerkenwell seeing him with bread and butter on the stage and knowing him cried out cuz cuz give me some to the great pleasure of the audience and so naturally did he act the smith's part that being at a fair in a country town and that farce being presented the only master smith of the town came to him saying well although your father speaks so ill of you yet when the fair is done if you will come and work with me i will give you twelve pence a week more than i give any other journeyman thus was he taken for a smith bread that was indeed as much of any trade to this low state the gloomy and exasperated fanatics who had so often smarted under the satirical whips of the dramatists had reduced the drama itself without however extinguishing the talents of the players or the finer ones of those who once derived their fame from that noble arena of genius the english stage at the first suspension of the theatre by the long parliament in sixteen forty two they gave vent to their feelings in an admirable satire about this time petitions to the parliament from various classes were put into vogue multitudes were presented to the house from all parts of the country and from the city of london and some of these were extraordinary the porters said to have been fifteen thousand in number declaimed with great eloquence on the blood-sucking malignants for insulting the privileges of parliament and threatened to come to extremities and make good the saying necessity has no law there was one from the beggars who declared that by means of the bishops and popish lords they knew not where to get bread and we are told of a third from the tradesmen's wives in london headed by a brewer's wife all these were encouraged by their party and were alike most thankfully accepted the satirists soon turned this new political trick of petitions into an instrument for their own purpose we have petitions of the poets of the house of commons to the king remonstrances to the porter's petition etc spirited political satires one of these the players petition to the parliament after being so long silenced that they might play again is replete with sarcastic allusions it may be found in that rare collection entitled rump song sixteen sixty two but with the usual incorrectness of the press in that day the following extract i have corrected from a manuscript copy now while you reign our low petition craves that we the king's true subjects and your slaves may in our comic mirth and tragic rage set up the theatre and show the stage this shop of truth and fancy where we vow not to act anything you disallow we will not dare at your strange votes to jeer or personate king pym with his state fleer 
footnote pym was then at the head of the commons and was usually deputed to address personally the motley petitioners we have a curious speech he made to the tradesmen's wives in eckard's history of england volume two two ninety end of footnote aspiring catiline should be forgot bloody sejanus or whoe'er could plot confusion gainst a state the war betwixt the parliament and just harry the sixth shall have no thought or mention cause their power not only placed but lost him in the tower nor will we parallel with least suspicion your synod with the spanish inquisition all these and such like maxims as may mar your soaring plots or show you what you are we shall omit lest our inventions shake them why should the men be wiser than you make them we think there should not such a difference be twixt our profession and your quality you meet plot act talk high with minds immense the like with us but only we speak sense inferior unto yours we can tell how to depose kings there we know more than you although not more than what we would then we likewise in our vast privilege agree but that yours is the larger and controls not only lives and fortunes but men's souls declaring by an enigmatic sense a privilege on each man's conscience as if the trinity could not consent to save a soul but by the parliament we make the people laugh at some strange show and as they laugh at us they do at you only in the contrary we disagree for you can make them cry faster than we your tragedies more real are expressed you murder men in earnest we in jest there we come short but if you follow thus some wise men fear you will come short of us as humbly as we did begin we pray dear schoolmasters you'll give us leave to play quickly before the king comes for we would be glad to say you've done a little good since you have sat your play is almost done as well as ours would it had ne'er begun but we shall find ere the last act be spent enter the king exeunt the parliament and high then up we go who by the frown of guilty members have been voted down until a legal trial show us how you use the king and high then up go you so pray your humble slaves with all their powers that when they have their due you may have yours such was the petition of the suppressed players in sixteen forty two but in sixteen fifty three their secret exultation appears although the stage was not yet restored to them in some verses prefixed to richard brome's plays by alexander brome which may close our little history alluding to the theatrical people he moralizes on the fate of players see the strange twirl of times when such poor things outlive the dates of parliaments or kings this revolution makes exploded wit now see the fall of those that ruined it and the condemned stage hath now obtained to see her executioners arraigned there's nothing permanent those high great men that rose from dust to dust may fall again and fate so orders things that the same hour sees the same man both in contempt and power for the multitude in whom the power doth lie do in one breath cry hail and crucify at this period though deprived of a theatre the taste for the drama was perhaps the more lively among its lovers for besides the performances already noticed sometimes connived at and sometimes protected by bribery in oliver's time they stole into a practice of privately acting at noblemen's houses particularly at holland house at kensington and alexander goff the woman actor was the jackal to give notice of time and place to the lovers of the drama according to the writer of historica histrionica 
the players urged by their necessities published several excellent manuscript plays which they had hoarded in their dramatic exchequers as the sole property of their respective companies in one year appeared fifty of these new plays of these dramas many have no doubt perished for numerous titles are recorded but the plays are not known yet some may still remain in their manuscript state in hands not capable of valuing them all our old plays were the property of the actors who bought them for their own companies the immortal works of shakespeare had not descended to us had hemming and condell felt no sympathy for the fame of their friend they had been scattered and lost and perhaps had not been discriminated among the numerous manuscript plays of that age one more effort during this suspension of the drama was made in sixteen fifty five to recall the public attention to its productions this was a very curious collection by john cotgrave entitled the english treasury of wit and language collected out of the most and best of our english dramatic poems it appears by cotgrave's preface that the dramatic poem as he calls our tragedies and comedies had been of late too much slighted he tells us how some not wanting in wit themselves but through a stiff and obstinate prejudice have in this neglect lost the benefit of many rich and useful observations not duly considering or believing that the framers of them were the most fluent and redundant wits that this age or i think any other ever knew he enters further into this just panegyric of our old dramatic writers whose acquired knowledge in ancient and modern languages and whose luxuriant fancies which they derive from no other sources but their own native growth are viewed to great advantage in cotgrave's commonplaces and perhaps still more in hayward's british muse which collection was made under the supervisal and by the valuable aid of oldis an experienced caterer of these relishing morsels end of section forty nine section fifty of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Drinking Customs in England. The ancient Bacchus, as represented in Gems and Statues, was a youthful and graceful divinity. He is so described by Ovid, and was so painted by Barry. He has the epithet of Silas, to express the light spirits which give wings to the soul. His voluptuousness was joyous and tender, and he was never viewed reeling with intoxication. According to Virgil, et quo cumque dea circum caput eget honestum, George 2, 392, which Dryden, contemplating on the red-faced boorish boy astride on a barrel in our signposts, tastelessly sinks into gross vulgarity. On what error side he turns his honest face. This Latinism of honestum, even the literal inelegance of Davidson had spirit enough to translate, where'er the god hath moved around his graceful head. The hideous figure of that ebriety, in its most disgusting stage, the ancients exposed in the bestial Silenus and his crew, and with these, rather than with the Ovidian and Virgilian deity, our own convivial customs have assimilated. We shall probably outlive that custom of hard drinking, which was so long one of our national vices the frenchman the italian and the spaniard only taste the luxury of the grape but seem never to have indulged in set convivial parties or drinking matches as some of the northern people of this folly of ours which was however a borrowed one and which lasted for two centuries the history is curious 
the variety of its modes and customs its freaks and extravagances the technical language introduced to raise it into an art and the inventions contrived to animate the progress of the thirsty souls of its votaries footnote prynne's tract entitled health's sickness is full of curious allusions to the drinking customs of the era of charles i his paradoxical title alludes to the sickness that results from too freely drinking healths End of footnote. nations like individuals in their intercourse are great imitators and we have the authority of camden who lived at the time for asserting that the english in their long wars in the netherlands first learnt to drown themselves with immoderate drinking and by drinking others healths to impair their own of all the northern nations they had been before this most commended for their sobriety and the historian adds that the vice had so diffused itself over the nation that in our days it was first restrained by severe laws footnote camden's history of queen elizabeth book three many statutes against drunkenness by way of prevention passed in the reign of james i our law looks on this vice as an aggravation of any offence committed not as an excuse for criminal misbehaviour see blackstone book four chapter two section three in mr gifford's messenger volume two four hundred fifty eight is a note to show that when we were young scholars we soon equalled if we did not surpass our masters mr gilchrist there furnishes an extract from sir richard baker's chronicle which traces the origin of this exotic custom to the source mentioned but the whole passage from baker is literally transcribed from camden End of footnote. here we have the authority of a grave and judicious historian for ascertaining the first period and even origin of this custom and that the nation had not heretofore disgraced itself by such prevalent ebriety is also confirmed by one of those curious contemporary pamphlets of a popular writer so invaluable to the philosophical antiquary tom nash a town wit of the reign of elizabeth long before camden wrote her history in his pierce penniless had detected the same origin superfluity in drink says this spirited writer is a sin that ever since we have mixed ourselves with the low countries is counted honourable but before we knew their lingering wars was held in that highest degree of hatred that might be then if we had seen a man go wallowing in the streets or lain sleeping under the board we should have spat at him and warned all our friends out of his company such was the fit source of this vile custom which is further confirmed by the barbarous dialect it introduced into our language all the terms of drinking which once abounded with us are without exception of a base northern origin footnote these barbarous phrases are dutch danish or german the term skinker a filler of wine a butler or cup-bearer according to phillips and in taverns as appears by our dramatic poets a drawer is dutch or according to dr knott purely danish from skinker half seas over or nearly drunk is likely to have been a proverbial phrase from the dutch applied to that state of ebriety by an idea familiar with those water rats thus op zee dutch means literally over sea mr gifford has recently told us in his johnson that it was a name given to a stupefying beer introduced into england from the low countries hence op zee or over sea and friesen in german signifies to swallow greedily from this vile alliance they compounded a harsh term 
often used in our old plays thus johnson i do not like the dullness of your eye it hath a heavy cast tis upsy dutch alchemist act four scene two and fletcher has upsy phrase which dr knott explains in his edition of decker's gull's horn book as a tipsy draught or swallowing liquor till drunk mr gifford says it was the name of friesland beer the meaning however was to drink swinishly like a dutchman we are indebted to the danes for many of our terms of jollity such as a rouse and a carouse mr gifford has given not only a new but very distinct explanation of these classical terms in his mazinger a rouse was a large glass in which a health was given the drinking of which by the rest of the company formed a carouse barnaby rich notices the carouse as an invention for which the first founder merited hanging it is necessary to add that there could be no rouse or carouse unless the glasses were emptied although we have lost the terms we have not lost the practice as those who have the honour of dining in public parties are still gratified by the animating cry of gentlemen charge your glasses according to blount's glossographia carouse is a corruption of two old german words gar signifying all and aus out so that to drink grouse is to drink all out hence carouse end a footnote but the best account i can find of all the refinements of this new science of potation when it seems to have reached its height is in our tom nash who being himself one of these deep experimental philosophers is likely to disclose all the mysteries of the craft he says now he is nobody that cannot drink supernagulum carouse the hunter's hoop quaff oopsy freeze cross with health gloves mumps frolics and a thousand such domineering inventions drinking supernagulum that is on the nail is a device which nash says is new come out of france but it had probably a northern origin for far northward it still exists this new device consisted in this that after a man says nash hath turned up the bottom of the cup to drop it on his nail and make a pearl with what is left which if it shed and cannot make it stand on by reason there is too much he must drink again for his penance the custom is also alluded to by bishop hall in his satirical romance of munda's altar et idem a discovery of a new world a work which probably swift read and did not forget the duke of tenterbelly in his oration when he drinks off his large goblet of twelve quarts on his election exclaims should he be false to their laws let never this goodly formed goblet of wine go jovially through me and then he set it to his mouth stole it off every drop save a little remainder which he was by custom to set upon his thumb's nail and lick it off as he did the phrase is in fletcher i am thine ad unguum that is he would drink with his friend to the last in a manuscript letter of the times i find an account of colombo the spanish ambassador being at oxford and drinking healths to the infanta the writer adds i shall not tell you how our doctors pledged healths to the infanta and the archduchess and if any left too big a snuff colombo would cry supernaculum supernaculum footnote when christian the fourth of denmark was at the court of our james the first on a visit drinking appears to have been carried to an excess there is extant an account of a court mask in which the actors were too tipsy to continue their parts 
luckily their majesties were not sufficiently sober to find fault End of footnote. this bacchic freak seems still preserved for a recent traveller sir george mackenzie has noticed the custom in his travels through iceland his host having filled a silver cup to the brim and put on the cover then held it towards the person who sat next to him and desired him to take off the cover and look into the cup a ceremony intended to secure fair play in filling it he drank our health desiring to be excused from emptying the cup on account of the indifferent state of his health but we were informed at the same time that if any one of us should neglect any part of the ceremony or fail to invert the cup placing the edge on one of the thumbs as a proof that we had swallowed every drop the defaulter would be obliged by the laws of drinking to fill the cup again and drink it off a second time in spite of their utmost exertions the penalty of a second draught was incurred by two of the company we were dreading the consequences of having swallowed so much wine and in terror lest the cup should be sent round again carouse the hunter's hoop carouse has been already explained the hunter's hoop alludes to the custom of hoops being marked on a drinking pot by which every man was to measure his draught shakespeare makes the jacobin jack cade among his furious reformations promise his friends that there shall be in england seven halfpenny loaves sold for a penny the three hooped pot shall have ten hoops and i will make it a felony to drink small beer i have elsewhere observed that our modern bacchanalians whose feats are recorded by the bottle and who insist on inequality in their rival combats may discover some ingenuity in that invention among our ancestors of their peg tankards of which a few may yet occasionally be found in derbyshire footnote these inventions for keeping every thirsty soul within bounds are alluded to by tom nash i do not know that his authority will be great as an antiquary but the things themselves he describes he had seen he tells us that king edgar because his subjects should not offend in swilling and bibbing as they did caused certain iron cups to be chained to every fountain and well-side and at every vintner's door with iron pins in them to stint every man how much he should drink and he who went beyond one of those pins forfeited a penny for every draught peg in his anana miana has minutely described these peg tankards which confirms this account of nash and nearly the antiquity of the custom they have in the inside a row of eight pins one above another from top to bottom the tankard holds two quarts so that there is a gill of ale that is half a pint of winchester measure between each pin the first person that drank was to empty the tankard to the first peg or pin the second was to empty to the next pin etc by which means the pins were so many measures to the compotators making them all drink alike or the same quantity and as the distance of the pins was such as to contain a large draught of liquor the company would be very liable by this method to get drunk especially when if they drank short of the pin or beyond it they were obliged to drink again in archbishop anselm's canons made in the council at london in eleven hundred two priests are enjoined not to go to drinking bouts nor to drink to pegs the words are ut presbytere non iant ad potationes nec ad pinus bibent wilkins volume one page three hundred eighty eight this shows the antiquity of this invention which at least was as old as the conquest End of footnote.
the invention of an age less refined than the present when we have heard of globular glasses and bottles which by their shape cannot stand but roll about the table thus compelling the unfortunate bacchanalian to drain the last drop or expose his recreant sobriety we must have recourse again to our old friend tom nash who acquaints us with some of the general rules and inventions for drinking as good as printed precepts or statutes by act of parliament that go from drunkard to drunkard as still to keep your first man not to leave any flocks in the bottom of the cup to knock the glass on your thumb when you have done to have some shoeing horn to pull on your wine as a rasher on the coals or a red herring shoeing horns sometimes called gloves are also described by bishop hall in his mundus altar at idem then sir comes me up a service of shoeing horns of all sorts salt cakes red herrings anchovies and gammon of bacon and abundance of such pullers on that famous surfeit of rhenish and pickled herrings which banquet proved so fatal to robert green a congenial wit and associate of our nash was occasioned by these shoeing horns massinger has given a curious list of a service of shoeing horns i usher such an unexpected dainty bit for breakfast as never yet i cooked tis not botargo fried frogs potatoes marrowed caviar carps tongues the pith of an english chine of beef nor our italian delicate oiled mushrooms and yet a drawer on too and if you show not an appetite and a strong one i'll not say to eat it but devour it without grace too for it will not stay a preface i am shamed and all my past provocatives will be jeered at messenger the guardian act two scene three footnote and yet a drawer on two that is an incitement to appetite the phrase is yet in use this drawer on was also technically termed a puller on and a shoeing horn in drink on the italian delicate oiled mushrooms still a favourite dish with the italians i have to communicate some curious knowledge in an original manuscript letter dated hereford fifteenth november sixteen hundred fifty nine the name of the writer wanting but evidently the composition of a physician who had travelled i find that the dressing of mushrooms was then a novelty the learned writer laments his error that he disdained to learn the cookery that occurred in my travels by a sullen principle of mistaken devotion and thus declined the great helps i had to enlarge and improve human diet this was an age of medicine when it was imagined that the health of mankind essentially depended on diet and moffat had written his curious book on this principle our writer in noticing the passion of the romans for mushrooms which was called an imperial dish says he had eaten it often at sir henry watton's table our resident ambassador at venice always dressed by the inspection of his dutch venetian johanna or of nick odart and truly it did deserve the old applause as i found it at his table it was far beyond our english food neither did any of us find it of hard digestion for we did not eat like adamites but as modest men would eat of muskmelons if it were now lawful to hold any kind of intelligence with nick udart i would only ask him sir henry wotton's art of dressing mushrooms and i hope that is not high treason sloane manuscript forty two ninety two end of footnote to knock the glass on the thumb was to show they had performed their duty barnaby rich describes this custom after having drank the president turned the bottom of the cup upward and in ostentation of his dexterity gave it a flip to make it cry ting 
they had among those domineering inventions some which we may imagine never took place till they were told by the hollow cask how the waning night grew old such were flap dragons which were small combustible bodies fired at one end and floated in a glass of liquor which an experienced toper swallowed unharmed while yet blazing such is dr johnson's accurate description who seems to have witnessed what he so well describes footnote see mr douse's curious illustrations of shakespeare volume one four hundred fifty seven a gentleman more intimately conversant with our ancient and domestic manners than perhaps any single individual in the country and a footnote when falstaff says of poins's acts of dexterity to ingratiate himself with the prince that he drinks off candle-ends for flap-dragons it seems that this was likewise one of these frolics for nash notices that the liquor was to be stirred about with a candle's end to make it taste better and not to hold your peace while the pot is stirring no doubt to mark the intrepidity of the miserable skinker the most illustrious feat of all is one however described by bishop hall if the drinker could put his finger into the flame of the candle without playing hit i miss i he is held a sober man however otherwise drunk he might be this was considered as a trial of victory among these canary birds or bibbers of canary wine footnote this term is used in bancroft's two books of epigrams and epitaphs sixteen hundred thirty nine i take it to have been an accepted one of that day End of footnote. we have a very common expression to describe a man in a state of ebriety that he is as drunk as a beast or that he is beastly drunk this is a libel on the brutes for the vice of ebriety is perfectly human i think the phrase is peculiar to ourselves and i imagine i have discovered its origin when ebriety became first prevalent in our nation during the reign of elizabeth it was a favourite notion among the writers of the time and on which they have exhausted their fancy that a man in the different stages of ebriety showed the most vicious quality of different animals or that a company of drunkards exhibited a collection of brutes with their different characteristics all drunkards are beasts says george gasconnier in a curious treatise on them footnote a delicate diet for dainty mouth drunkards wherein the foul abuse of common carousing and quaffing with hearty draughts is honestly admonished by george gasconnier esq fifteen hundred seventy six end of footnote and he proceeds in illustrating his proposition but the satirist nash has classified eight kinds of drunkards a fanciful sketch from the hand of a master in humour and which could only have been composed by a close spectator of their manners and habits the first is ape drunk and he leaps and sings and hollows and danceth for the heavens the second is lion drunk and he flings the pots about the house calls the host as we breaks the glass windows with his dagger and is apt to quarrel with any man that speaks to him the third is swine drunk heavy lumpish and sleepy and cries for a little more drink and a few more clothes the fourth is sheep drunk wise in his own conceit when he cannot bring forth a right word the fifth is maudlin drunk when a fellow will weep for kindness in the midst of his drink and kiss you saying by god captain i love thee go thy ways thou dost not think so often of me as i do of thee i would if it pleased god i could not love thee so well as i do and then he puts his finger in his eye and cries the sixth is martin drunk when a man is drunk and drinks himself sober ere he stir 
the seventh is goat drunk when in his drunkenness he hath no mind but on lechery the eighth is fox drunk when he is crafty drunk as many of the dutchmen be which will never bargain but when they are drunk all these species and more i have seen practised in one company at one sitting when i have been permitted to remain sober amongst them only to note their several humours these beast drunkers are characterised in a frontispiece to a curious tract on drunkenness where the men are represented with the heads of apes swine etc etc a new era in this history of our drinking parties occurred about the time of the restoration when politics heated their wine and drunkenness and loyalty became more closely connected as the puritanic coldness wore off the people were perpetually in sixteen hundred fifty warmed in drinking the king's health on their knees and among various kinds of ranting cavalierism the cavaliers during cromwell's usurpation usually put a crumb of bread into their glass and before they drank it off with cautious ambiguity exclaimed god send this cromwell down which by the way preserves the orthopy of that extraordinary man's name and may be added to the instances adduced in our present volume on the orthography of proper names we have a curious account of a drunken bout by some royalists told by whitelock in his memorials it bore some resemblance to the drinking party of cataline they mingled their own blood with their wine Footnote i shall preserve the story in the words of whitelock it was something ludicrous as well as terrific from berkshire in may sixteen hundred fifty that five drunkards agreed to drink the king's health in their blood and that each of them should cut off a piece of his buttock and fry it upon the gridiron which was done by four of them of whom one did bleed so exceedingly that they were fain to send for a surgeon and so were discovered the wife of one of them hearing that her husband was amongst them came to the room and taking up a pair of tongs laid about her and so saved the cutting of her husband's flesh whitelock's memorials page four hundred fifty three second edition End of footnote after the restoration burnet complains of the excess of convivial loyalty drinking the king's health was set up by too many as a distinguishing mark of loyalty and drew many into great excess after his majesty's restoration end of section fifty Section 51 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Anecdotes a writer of penetration sees connections in literary anecdotes which are not immediately perceived by others in his hands anecdotes even should they be familiar to us are susceptible of deductions and inferences which become novel and important truths facts of themselves are barren it is when these facts pass through reflections and become interwoven with our feelings or our reasonings that they are the finest illustrations that they assume the dignity of philosophy teaching by example that in the moral world they are what the wise system of bacon inculcated in the natural knowledge deduced from experiments the study of nature in her operations when examples are pointed out to us says lord bolingbroke there is a kind of appeal with which we are flattered made to our senses as well as to our understandings the instruction comes then from our authority we yield to fact when we resist speculation for this reason writers and artists should among their recreations be forming a constant acquaintance with the history of their departed kindred 
in literary biography a man of genius always finds something which relates to himself the studies of artists have a great uniformity and their habits of life are monotonous they have all the same difficulties to encounter although they do not all meet with the same glory how many secrets may the man of genius learn from literary anecdotes important secrets which his friends will not convey to him he traces the effects of similar studies warned sometimes by failures and often animated by watching the incipient and shadowy attempts which closed in a great work from one he learns in what manner he planned and corrected from another he may overcome those obstacles which perhaps at that very moment make him rise in despair from his own unfinished labour what perhaps he had in vain desired to know for half his life is revealed to him by a literary anecdote and thus the amusements of indolent hours may impart the vigour of study as we find sometimes in the fruit we have taken for pleasure the medicine which restores our health how superficial is that cry of some impertinent pretended geniuses of these times who affect to exclaim give me no anecdotes of an author but give me his works i have often found the anecdotes more interesting than the works dr johnson devoted one of his periodical papers to a defence of anecdotes and expresses himself thus on certain collectors of anecdotes they are not always so happy as to select the most important i know not well what advantage posterity can receive from the only circumstance by which tickle has distinguished addison from the rest of mankind the irregularity of his pulse nor can i think myself overpaid for the time spent in reading the life of malherbe by being enabled to relate after the learned biographer that malherbe had two predominant opinions one that the looseness of a single woman might destroy all her boast of ancient descent the other that french beggars made use very improperly and barbarously of the phrase noble gentleman because either word included the sense of both these just observations may perhaps be further illustrated by the following notices dr j wharton has informed the world that many of our poets have been handsome this certainly neither concerns the world nor the class of poets it is trifling to tell us that dr johnson was accustomed to cut his nails to the quick i am not much gratified by being informed that menage wore a greater number of stockings than any other person excepting one whose name i have really forgotten the biographer of cuyas a celebrated lawyer says that two things were remarkable of this scholar the first that he studied on the floor lying prostrate on a carpet with his books about him and secondly that his perspiration exhaled an agreeable smell which he used to inform his friends he had in common with alexander the great this admirable biographer should have told us whether he frequently turned from his very uneasy attitude somebody informs us that guy patin resembles cicero whose statue is preserved at rome on which he enters into a comparison of patin with cicero but a man may resemble a statue of cicero and yet not be cicero bayet loads his life of descartes with a thousand minutiae which less disgrace the philosopher than the biographer was it worth informing the public that descartes was very particular about his wigs that he had them manufactured at paris and that he always kept four that he wore green taffety in france but that in holland he quitted taffety for cloth and that he was fond of omelettes of eggs it is an odd observation of clarendon in his own life that mr chillingworth was of a stature little superior to mr hales and it was an age in which there were many great and wonderful men of that size lord falkland formerly sir lucius carey was of a low stature and smaller than most men and of sidney godolphin there was never so great a mind and spirit contained in so little room so that lord falkland used to say merrily that he thought it was a great ingredient in his friendship for mr godolphin that he was pleased to be found in his company where he was the properer man 
this irrelevant observation of lord clarendon is an instance where a great mind will sometimes draw inferences from accidental coincidences and establish them into a general principle as if the small size of the men had even the remotest connection with their genius and their virtues perhaps too there was in this a tincture of the superstitions of the times whatever it was the fact ought not to have degraded the truth and dignity of historical narrative we have writers who cannot discover the particulars which characterize the man their souls like damp gunpowder cannot ignite with the spark when it falls on them yet of anecdotes which appear trifling something may be alleged in their defence it is certainly safer for some writers to give us all they know than to try their discernment for rejection let us sometimes recollect that the page over which we toil will probably furnish materials for authors of happier talents i would rather have a birch or a hawkins appear heavy cold and prolix than that anything material which concerns a tillotson or a johnson should be lost it must also be confessed that an anecdote or a circumstance which may appear inconsequential to a reader may bear some remote or latent connection a biographer who has long contemplated the character he records sees many connections which escape an ordinary reader kippis enclosing the life of the diligent dr birch has from his own experience no doubt formed an apology for that minute research which some have thought this writer carried to excess it may be alleged in our author's favour that a man who has a deep and extensive acquaintance with a subject often sees a connection and importance in some smaller circumstances which may not immediately be discerned by others and on that account may have reasons for inserting them that will escape the notice of superficial minds End of section fifty one Section 52 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano curiosities of literature volume two by isaac desraeli chapter fifty two condemned poets i flatter myself that those readers who have taken any interest in my volume have not conceived me to have been deficient in the elevated feeling which from early life i have preserved for the great literary character if time weaken our enthusiasm it is the coldness of age which creeps on us but the principle is unalterable which inspired the sympathy who will not venerate those master spirits quote, whose published labors advance the good of mankind end quote, and those books which are quote, the precious life-blood of a master spirit embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life end quote. but it has happened that i have more than once incurred the censure of the inconsiderate and the tasteless for attempting to separate those writers who exist in a state of perpetual illusion who live on curiously which is an evil for themselves and to no purpose of life which is an evil to others i have been blamed for exemplifying quote, the illusions of writers in verse End quote. footnote calamities of authors volume two page three thirteen End of footnote by the remarkable case of percival stockdale footnote it first appeared in a review of his memoirs End of footnote who after a condemned silence of nearly half a century like a vivacious spectre throwing aside his shroud in gaiety came forward a venerable man in his eightieth year to assure us 
of the immortality of one of the worst poets of his age, and for this wrote his own memoirs, which only proved that when authors are troubled with a literary hallucination, and possess the unhappy talents of reasoning in their madness, a little raillery, if it cannot cure, may serve at least as a salutary regimen. I shall illustrate the case of condemned authors, who will still be pleading after their trials, by a foreign dramatic writer. Among those incorrigible murmurers at public justice, not the least extraordinary was a Monsieur Pejo de Boussole, who, in 1775, had a tragedy, Les Arce Seda, in six acts, printed, quote, not as it was acted, end quote, as Fielding says on the title page of one of his comedies, but, quote, as it was damned, end quote. In a preface, this Sir Fretful, more inimitable than that original, with all the gravity of an historical narrative, details the public conspiracy, and with all the pathetic touches of a shipwrecked mariner, the agonies of his literary egotism. He declares that it is absurd to condemn a piece which they can only know by the title, for heard it had never been. And yet, he observes, with infinite naivete, quote, My piece is as generally condemned as if the world had it all by heart. End quote. One of the great objections against this tragedy was its monstrous plan of six acts. This innovation did not lean towards improvement in the minds of those who had endured the long sufferings of tragedies of the accepted size. But the author offers some solemn reasons to induce us to believe that six acts were so far from being too many that the piece had been more perfect with a seventh. Monsieur de Boussolet had, perhaps, been happy to have known that other dramatists have considered that the usual restrictions are detrimental to a grand genius. Nat Lee, when in Bedlam, wrote a play in twenty-five acts. Our philosophical dramatist, from the constituent principles of the human mind, and the physical powers of man, and the French nation more particularly, deduces the origin of the sublime, and the faculty of attention. The plan of his tragedy is agreeable to these principles. Monarchs, queens, and rivals, and every class of men, it is therefore grand, and the acts can be listened to, and therefore it is not too long. It was the high opinion that he had formed of human nature, and the French people, which at once terrified, and excited him to finish a tragedy, which, he modestly adds, quote, may not have the merit of any single one, but which one day will be discovered to include the labor bestowed on fifty. End quote. No great work was ever produced without a grand plan. Quote, Some critics, says our author, have ventured to assert that my six acts may easily be reduced to the usual five, without injury to the conduct of the fable. End quote. To reply to this required a complete analysis of the tragedy, which, having been found more voluminous than the tragedy itself, he considerately, quote, published separately, end quote. It would be curious to ascertain whether a single copy of the analysis of a condemned tragedy was ever sold. And yet, this critical analysis was such an admirable and demonstrative criticism that the author assures us that it proved the absolute impossibility, quote, and the most absolute too, end quote, that his piece could not suffer the slightest curtailment. It demonstrated more that the gradation and the development of interest required necessarily seven acts, but from dread of carrying this innovation too far, the author omitted one act, which passed behind the scenes. Footnote. The words are, Una derriere les scene. I am not sure of the meaning, but an act behind the scenes will be perfectly in character with this dramatic bard. End of footnote. But which ought to have come in between the fifth and sixth. Another point is proved, that the attention of an audience, the physical powers of man, can be kept up with interest much longer than has been calculated. 
that his piece only takes up two hours and three quarters, or three hours at most, if some of the most impassioned parts were but declaimed rapidly. Footnote. The exact reasoning of Sir Fretful in The Critic, when Mrs. Dangle thought his piece, quote, rather too long, end quote, while he proves his play was, quote, a remarkably short play, end quote. Quote, the first evening you can spare me three hours and a half, I'll undertake to read you the whole, from beginning to end, with the prologue and epilogue, and allow time for the music between the acts. The watch here, you know, is the critic. End of footnote. Now we come to the history of all the disasters which happened at the acting of this tragedy. Quote, How can people complain that my piece is tedious, when, after the first act, they would never listen ten minutes to it? Why did they attend to the first scenes, and even applaud one? Let me not be told, because these were sublime, and commanded the respect of the cabal, raised against it, because there are other scenes far more sublime in the piece, which they perpetually interrupted. Will it be believed that they pitched upon the scene of the sacrifice of Volgacy as one of the most tedious? The scene of Volgacy, which is the finest in my piece, not a verse, not a word in it, can be omitted. Footnote. Again, Sir Fretful, when Dangle, quote, ventures to suggest that the interest rather falls off in the fifth act, end quote. Quote, rises, I believe you mean, sir, end quote. Quote, no, I don't, upon my word, end quote. Quote, yes, yes, you do, upon my soul. It certainly don't fall off. No, no, it don't fall off, end quote. End of footnote. Everything tends towards the catastrophe, and it reads in the closet as well as it would affect us on the stage. I was not, however, astonished at this. What men hear, and do not understand, is always tedious, and it was recited in so shocking a tone by the actress, who, not having entirely recovered from a fit of illness, was flurried by the tumult of the audience. She declaimed in a twanging tone like psalm-singing, so that the audience could not hear, among the fatiguing discordances, he means their own hissing, or separate the thoughts and words from the full chant which accompanied them. They objected perpetually to the use of the word madame, between two female rivals, as too comic. One of the pit, when an actress said madame, cried out, Say, princesse! This disconcerted the actress. They also objected to the words apropos and mal apropos. Yet, after all, how are there too many madames in the piece, since they do not amount to forty-six in the course of forty-four scenes? Of these, however, I have erased half. End quote. This historian of his own wrong-headedness proceeds, with all the simplicity of this narrative, to describe the hubbub. Quote, Thus it was impossible to connect what they were hearing with what they had heard. In the short intervals of silence, the actors, who, during the tumult, forgot their characters, tried with difficulty to recover their conception. The conspirators were prepared to a man, not only in their head, but some with the written notes, had their watchwords, to set their party a-going. They seemed to act with the most extraordinary concert. They seemed to know the exact moment when they were to give the word, and drown, in their hurly-burly, the voice of the actor who had a passionate part to declaim, and thus break the connection between the speakers. All this produced so complete an effect, that it seemed as if the actors themselves had been of the conspiracy. So willful and so active was the execution of the plot. It was particularly during the fifth and sixth acts that the cabal was most outrageous. They knew these were the most beautiful, and deserved particular attention. Such a humming arose, that the actors seemed to have had their heads turned. Some lost their voice, some declaimed at random. The prompter in vain cried out. Nothing was heard, and everything was said. The actor, who could not hear the catchword, remained disconcerted and silent. The whole was broken, wrong and right. It was all Hebrew. Nor was this all. 
the actors behind the scene were terrified, and they either came forwards trembling, and only watching the signs of their brother actors, or would not venture to show themselves. The machinist only, with his scene shifters, who felt so deep an interest in the fate of my piece, was tranquil and attentive to his duty to produce a fine effect. After the hurly-burly was over, he left the actors mute with their arms crossed. He opened the scenery, and not an actor could enter on it. The pit, more clamorous than ever, would not suffer the denouement. Such was the conduct, and such the intrepidity, of the army employed to besiege the Arsacida. Such was the cause of that accusation of tediousness made against a drama, which has most evidently the contrary defect. End quote. Such is the history of a damned dramatist, written by himself, with a truth and simplicity worthy of a happier fate. It is admirable to see a man, who was himself so deeply involved in the event, preserve the observing calmness which could discover the minutest occurrence, and, allowing for his particular conception of the cause, detailing them with the most rigid veracity, this author was unquestionably a man of the most honorable probity, and not destitute of intellectual ability. But he must serve as a useful example of that wrong-headed nature in some men, which has produced so many, quote, abbots of unreason, end quote, in society, whom it is in vain to convince by a reciprocation of arguments, who, assuming false principles, act rightly according to themselves, a sort of rational lunacy, which, when it discovers itself in politics and religion, and in the more common affairs of life, has produced the most unhappy effects. But this fanaticism, when confined to poetry, only amuses us with the ludicrous, and in the persons of Monsieur de Brousselet and of Percival Stockdale, may offer some very fortunate self-recollections in that, quote, calamity of authors, end quote, which I have called, quote, the illusions of writers in verse, end quote. End of section 52 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 53 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli acajou and zerville as a literary curiosity and as a supplemental anecdote to the article of prefaces i cannot pass over the suppressed preface to the acajou et zerville of duclos which of itself is almost a singular instance of hardy ingenuity in an address to the public this single volume is one of the most whimsical of fairy tales and an amusing satire originating in an odd circumstance count tessin the swedish ambassador at the court of france had a number of grotesque designs made by boucher the king painter and engraved by the first artists the last plate had just been finished when the count was recalled and appointed prime minister and governor to the crown prince a place he filled with great honor and in emulation of fenelon composed letters on the education of a prince which have been translated he left behind him in france all the plates in the hands of boucher who having shown them to duclos for their singular invention regretted that he had bestowed so much fancy on a fairy tale which was not to be had duclos to relieve his regrets offered to invent a tale to correspond with these grotesque subjects this seemed not a little difficult in the first plate the author appears in his morning gown writing in his study surrounded by apes rats butterflies and smoke in another a prince is dressed in the french costume of seventeen forty strolling full of thought in the shady walk of ideas in a third plate the prince is conversing with a fairy who rises out of a gooseberry which he has plucked two dwarfs 
discovered in another gooseberry give a sharp fillip to the prince who seems much embarrassed by their tiny maliciousness in another walk he eats an apricot which opens with the most beautiful of faces a little melancholy and leaning on one side in another print he finds the body of his lovely face and the hands and he adroitly joins them together such was the set of these incomprehensible and capricious inventions which the lighter fancy and ingenuity of duclos converted into a fairy story full of pleasantry and satire footnote the plates of the original edition are in the quarto form they have been poorly reduced in the common editions in twelves End of footnote. among the novelties of this small volume not the least remarkable is the dedication of this fairy romance to the public which excited great attention and charmed and provoked our author's fickle patron duclos here openly ridicules and dares his protector and his judge this hazardous attack was successful and the author soon acquired the reputation which he afterwards maintained of being a writer who little respected the common prejudices of the world Frerin, replied by a long criticism entitled réponse du public à l'auteur d'acajou but its severity was not discovered in its length so that the public who had been so keenly ridiculed and so heartily braved in the light and sparkling page of the haughty duclos preferred the caustic truths and the pleasant insult in this epistle to the public the author informs us that excited by example and encouraged by the success he had often witnessed he designed to write a piece of nonsense he was only embarrassed by the choice of subject politics morals and literature were equally the same to me but i found strange to say all these matters preoccupied by persons who seemed to have laboured with the same view i found silly things in all kinds and i saw myself under the necessity of a the reasonable ones to become singular so that i do not yet despair that we may one day discover truth when we shall have exhausted all our errors i first proposed to write down all erudition to show the freedom and independence of genius whose fertility is such as not to require borrowing anything from foreign sources but i observed that this had sunk into a mere commonplace trite and trivial invented by indolence adopted by ignorance and which adds nothing to genius mathematics which has succeeded to erudition begins to be unfashionable we know at present indeed that one may be as great a dizzard in resolving a problem as in restoring a reading everything is compatible with genius but nothing can give it for the bel esprit so much envied so much sought after it is almost as ridiculous to pretend to it as it is difficult to attain thus the scholar is contemned the mathematician tires the man of wit and genius is hissed what is to be done having told the whimsical origin of this tale duclos continues i do not know my dear public if you will approve of my design however it appears to me ridiculous enough to deserve your favour for to speak to you like a friend you appear to unite all the stages of human life only to experience all their cross accidents you are a child to run after trifles a youth when driven by your passions and in mature age you conclude you are wise because your follies are of a more solemn nature for you grow old only to dote to talk at random to act without design and to believe you judge because you pronounce sentence i respect you greatly i esteem you but little you are not worthy of being loved these are my sentiments respecting you if you insist on others from me in that case i am your most humble and obedient servant the caustic pleasantry of this epistle dedicatory was considered by some mawkish critics so offensive that when the editor of the cabinet de fées a vast collection of fairy tales republished this little playful satire and whimsical fancy piece he thought proper to cancel the epistle concluding that it was entirely wanting in that respect with which the public ought to be addressed this editor of course was a frenchman we view him in the ridiculous attitude of making his profound bow and expressing all this high consideration for this same public while with his opera hat in his hand he is sweeping away the most poignant and delectable page of agajou and zephile 
End of section 53section fifty four of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli tom a bedlam's the history of a race of singular mendicants known by the name of tom a bedlam's connects itself with that of our poetry not only will they live with our language since shakespeare has perpetuated their existence but they themselves appear to have been the occasion of creating a species of wild fantastic poetry peculiar to our nation bethlehem hospital formed in its original institution a contracted and penurious charity footnote the establishment could originally accommodate no more than six lunatics in sixteen hundred forty four the number had only increased to forty four and the building had nearly perished for want of funds when the city raised a subscription and repaired it after the great fire it was re-established on a much larger scale in moorfields End of footnote. its governors soon discovered that the metropolis furnished them with more lunatics than they had calculated on they also required from the friends of the patients a weekly stipend besides clothing it is a melancholy fact to record in the history of human nature that when one of their original regulations prescribed that persons who put in patients should provide their clothes it was soon observed that the poor lunatics were frequently perishing by the omission of this slight duty from those former friends so soon forgotten were they whom none found an interest to recollect they were obliged to open contributions to provide a wardrobe in consequence of the limited resources of the hospital they relieved the establishment by frequently discharging patients whose cure might be very equivocal harmless lunatics thrown thus into the world often without a single friend wandered about the country chanting wild ditties and wearing a fantastical dress to attract the notice of the charitable on whose alms they lived they had a kind of costume which i find described by randall holm in a curious and extraordinary work footnote the academy of armory book two chapter three page one hundred sixty one this is a singular work where the writer has contrived to turn the barren subjects of heraldry into an entertaining encyclopedia containing much curious knowledge on almost every subject but this folio more particularly exhibits the most copious vocabulary of old english terms it has been said that there are not more than twelve copies extant of this very rare work which is probably not true it is certainly not correct the work is however rare and valuable End of footnote. the bedlam has a long staff and a cow or ox-horn by his side his clothing fantastic and ridiculous for being a madman he is madly decked and dressed all over with rubens ribbons feathers cuttings of cloth and what not to make him seem a madman or one distracted when he is no other than a wandering and dissembling knave this writer here points out one of the grievances resulting from licensing even harmless lunatics to roam about the country for a set of pretended madmen called abram men a cant term for certain sturdy rogues concealed themselves in their costume covered the country and pleaded the privileged denomination when detected in their depredations footnote 
in that curious source of our domestic history the english villainies of decker we find a lively description of the abram cove or abram man the impostor who personated a tom a bedlam he was terribly disguised with his grotesque rags his staff his knotted hair and with the more disgusting contrivances to excite pity still practised among a class of our mendicants who in their cant language are still said to sham abraham this impostor was therefore as suited his purpose and the place capable of working on the sympathy by uttering a silly monding or demanding of charity or terrifying the easy fears of women children and domestics as he wandered up and down the country they refused nothing to a being who was as terrific to them as robin goodfellow or raw head and bloody bones thus as edgar expresses it sometimes with lunatic bands sometimes with prayers the gestures of this impostor were a counterfeit puppet play they came with a hollow noise whooping leaping gambling wildly dancing with a fierce or distracted look these sturdy mendicants were called tom of bedlin's band of madcaps or poor tom's flock of wild geese decker has preserved their mond or begging good worship master bestow your reward on a poor man that hath been in bedlam without bishop's gate three years four months and nine days and bestow one piece of small silver towards his fees which he is indebted there of three pounds thirteen shillings seven and a half pence or to such effect or now dame well and wisely what will you give poor tom one pound of your sheep's feathers to make poor tom a blanket or one cutting of your sow's side no bigger than my arm or one piece of your salt meat to make poor tom a sharing horn or one cross of your small silver towards a pair of shoes well and wisely give poor tom an old sheet to keep him from the cold or an old doublet and jerkin of my master's well and wisely god save the king in his council such is a history drawn from the very archives of mendicity and imposture and written perhaps as far back as the reign of james i but which prevailed in that of elizabeth as shakespeare has so finely shown in his edgar this mond and these assumed manners and costume i should not have preserved from their utter penury but such was the rude material which shakespeare has worked up into that most fanciful and richest vein of native poetry which pervades the character of the wandering edgar tormented by the foul fiend when he bethought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast and the poet proceeds with a minute picture of bedlam beggars see lear act two scene three End of footnote. sir walter scott first obligingly suggested to me that these roving lunatics were outdoor pensioners of bedlam sent about to live as well as they could with the pittance granted by the hospital the fullest account that i have obtained of these singular persons is drawn from a manuscript note transcribed from some of aubrey's papers which i have not seen printed till the breaking out of the civil wars tom of bedlam's did travel about the country they had been poor distracted men that had been put into bedlam where recovering some soberness they were licentiated to go a-begging i e they had on their left arm an armilla an iron ring for the arm about four inches long as printed in some works footnote aubrey's information is perfectly correct for those impostors who assumed the character of tom bedlam's for their own nefarious purposes used to have a mark burnt in their arms which they showed as the mark of bedlam the english villainies of decker chapter seventeen sixteen hundred forty eight 
End of footnote. They could not get it off. They wore about their necks a great horn of nox in a string or baudry, which, when they came to a house, they did wind, and they put the drink given to them into this horn, whereto they put a stopple. Since the wars I do not remember to have seen any one of them. The civil wars, probably, cleared the country of all sorts of vagabonds, but among the royalists or the parliamentarians we did not know that in their rank and file they had so many Tom Bedlams. I have now to explain something in the character of Edgar in Lear, on which the commentators seem to have ingeniously blundered, from an imperfect knowledge of the character which Edgar personates. Edgar, in wandering about the country, for a safe disguise, assumes the character of these Tom o' Bedlams. He thus closes one of his distracted speeches. Poor Tom, thy horn is dry. On this, Johnson is content to inform us that men that begged under pretense of lunacy used formerly to carry a horn and blow it through the streets this is no explanation of edgar's allusion to the dryness of his horn stevens adds a fanciful note that edgar alludes to a proverbial expression thy horn is dry designed to express that a man has said all he could say and further stevens supposes that edgar speaks these words aside as if he had been quite weary of tom abedlam's part and could not keep it up any longer the reasons of all this conjectural criticism are a curious illustration of perverse ingenuity aubrey's manuscript note has shown us that the bedlam's horn was also a drinking horn and edgar closes his speech in the perfection of the assumed character and not as one who had grown weary of it by making the mendicant lunatic desirous of departing from a heath to march as he cries to wakes and fairs and market towns poor tom thy horn is dry as more likely places to solicit alms and he is thinking of his drink money when he cries that his horn is dry an itinerant lunatic chanting wild ditties fancifully attired gay with the simplicity of childhood yet often moaning with the sorrows of a troubled man a mixture of character at once grotesque and plaintive became an interesting object to poetical minds. It is probable that the character of Edgar, in the Lear of Shakespeare, first introduced the hazardous conception into the poetical world. Poems composed in the character of a Tom o' Bedlam appear to have formed a fashionable class of poetry among the wits. They seem to have held together their poetical contests, and some of these writers became celebrated for their successful efforts for old isaac walton mentions a mr william bass as one who has made the choice songs of the hunter in his career and of tom of bedlam and many others of note bishop percy in his relics of ancient english poetry has preserved six of what he calls mad songs expressing his surprise that the english should have more songs and ballads on the subject of madness than any of their neighbours for such are not found in the collection of songs of the french italian etc and nearly insinuates for their cause that we are perhaps more liable to the calamity of madness than other nations this superfluous criticism had been spared had that elegant collector been aware of the circumstance which had produced this class of poems and recollected the more ancient original in the edgar of shakespeare some of the mad songs which the bishop has preserved are of too modern a date to suit the title of his work being written by tom durfey for his comedies of don quixote i shall preserve one of more ancient date fraught with all the wild spirit of this peculiar character footnote 
i discovered the present in a very scarce collection entitled wit and drollery sixteen hundred sixty one an edition however which is not the earliest of this once fashionable miscellany End of footnote. this poem must not be read without a continued reference to the personated character delirious and fantastic strokes of sublime imagination are mixed with familiar comic humour and even degraded by the cant language for the gipsy habits of life of these tom o bedlams had confounded them with the progging abram men footnote harman in his curious caveat a warning for common cursitors vulgarly called vagabonds fifteen hundred sixty six describes the abraham man as a pretended lunatic who wandered the country over soliciting food or charity at farmhouses or frightening and bullying the peasantry for the same they described themselves as cruelly treated in bedlam and nearly in the words of shakespeare's edgar End of footnote these luckless beings are described by decker as sometimes exceeding merry and could do nothing but sing songs fashioned out of their own brains now they danced now they would do nothing but laugh and weep or were dogged and sullen both in look and speech all they did all they sung was alike unconnected indicative of the desultory and rambling wits of the chanter a tom o bedlam song from the hag and hungry goblin that into rags would run ye all the spirits that stand by the naked man in the book of moons defend ye that of your five sound senses you never be forsaken nor travel from yourselves with tom abroad to beg your bacon chorus nor never sing any food in feeding money drink or clothing come dame or maid be not afraid for tom will injure nothing of thirty bare years have i twice twenty been enraged and of forty been three times fifteen endurance soundly caged in the lovely lofts of bedlam in stubble soft and dainty brave bracelets strong sweet whips ding-dong and a wholesome hunger plenty with a thought i took for maudlin and a cruse of cockle pottage and a thing thus tall sky bless you all i fell into this dotage i slept not till the conquest till then i never waked till the roguish boy of love where i lay me found and stripped me naked when short i have shorn my sow's face and swigged my horn barrel in an oaken inn do i pawn my skin as a suit of guilt apparel the morn's my constant mistress and the lovely owl my morrow the flaming drake and the night crow make me music to my sorrow the palsy plague these pounces when i prig your pigs are pullen your culvers take or mateless make your chanticleer and sullen when i want prevent with humphrey i soften when benighted to repose in pulls with waking souls i never am affrighted i know more than apollo for oft when he lies sleeping i behold the stars at mortal wars and the rounded welkin weeping the moon embraces her shepherd and the queen of love her warrior while the first does horn the stars of the morn and the next the heavenly farrier with a heart of furious fancies whereof i am commander with a burning spear and a horse of air to the wilderness i wander with a night of ghosts and shadows i summon them to tourney ten leagues beyond the wild world's end methinks it is no journey the last stanza of this bedlam song contains the seeds of exquisite romance a stanza worth many an admired poem end of section fifty four